Thank you all for being here. Under the new um, Van Wolf rules, we have a forum. All right. Nice to know. It works. I'd like to uh, introduce a, a soon to be member of the committee, Bobby Baye, back here. Bobby will be, unless he some runs into some kind of political trouble, which is possible, I knowing Bobby's myself. background. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate so, the faith in me. <laughs> he is, uh, I think, scheduled to be appointed by Fair Oaks uh, City Council this coming Thursday, he said. Yes, sir. So, uh, welcome. Thank you, sir. I'd like Thank to particularly you. welcome you. I'm Bitsy Pratt, and we have had no representatives from Fair Oaks. Wow. So you're, you're, you're missing a person you bet. Um, you bet. on our committee work. And I mentioned that in our report, and I apologize to you, um, but it, it's not too late. Well, I, I'm here flying the wall, kind of infiltrating slowly. Uh, once I get appointed, I'll be a little more vocal, just a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for being here, Bobby. No. Okay, well, let's move on in. Uh, the minutes are in your agenda. I don't think that we got those out, but Erica, I think she, it's not her fault that they're not out. It's just I didn't review them until last night. I didn't find anything, but I'd like to postpone consideration of those until the next meeting and uh, let you have a chance to go through them. They're pretty uh, detailed. Uh, so that brings us to public comment. Anything back from the Seth Mitchell phone back there? No, sir, thank you. Comments? No. no. Mr. Newspaper Man, chart right. <laughs> okay. No public comments. Update from the Projects Committee. Who's reporting? Busy? That is my report. Um, well, we have work to offer. Um, it's not in the best format visually. Yes, um, I hope that we can recruit some help to finalize that. Um, our um, support team that's working on the PowerPoint is not here today, so I can't get an update on that. Um, but I've submitted to Northern and to, to each of you in the uh, project's GIS subcommittee um, a list of 24 recommendations for roads. Um, we chose to go in a very non-controversial uh, direction. Um, we're not we're not trying to draw fire. We're trying to get something in place that helps move people in and around the city, um, and to take some heat off the main street uh, merchants um, by way of improving the routes around main street going east and west and north and south. Um, so you can review that information on the website. Um, I talked a little bit about some of the some of it last. Um, but we're at a point really where we need the technical support with our PowerPoint and our maps and so forth. Any other member, members of that committee? Senator, mm -hmm. good to see you back here. Uh, Steve Sharma. Uh, any other members of that committee like to offer any comments? I just think Bitsy did a good job with the summary. Very good. Let's move on to the uh, next. Not, I don't have a comment about that, but in terms of, of, of procedure, if you will, and how this uh, the outreach committee handles the information, are we waiting for formal approval, discussion of the recommendations? Are we getting ready to post it on the website so that the public in general can? I you know transparency is a, a big issue, so. Um, at what time do we start promoting the recommendations of these projects and if they're moving forward to the public entities that we represent? Um, Debbie, comments on that? <laughs> probably have several. <laughs> I, I, in, in what I would like to see happen is that we get the full scope of the recommendations on the table. I know that in addition to the projects that, that the committee, GIS Projects Committee, has offered up here, there are other recommendations. And I know, Ben, is your, your recommendation about the, the loop of roundabouts is not 
included in that context, is that right? Some of it is. Okay. Well, a lot of that's in the crowdsource. Okay, and, and, and what I'm trying to do is, my hope is that we get all of the puzzle pieces on the table and that as a full committee we discuss those and then we have some votes about whether it's going to be in or out. So if you follow, the, if you support that line of reasoning, um, I think it's best that we don't put stuff out there yet and on a sort of haphazard basis get feedback because I think we'll start to stumble over ourselves. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, I, as we did before the break, there's a presentation that I can get my hands on. I put it on there as, on the website, as this was the presentation from the state. So that much is out there yeah. if I get my hands on it. Um, and, I, and I think the nature of our meetings and the nature of Missy's meetings, I, obviously not trying to hide anything from the public, but we're just not formally declaring certain information. Right. It's, I think until the committee has had a chance to digest it and give it a thumbs up and thumbs down on certain projects. The one arena <clears throat> that we don't have access to yet is the information from ANCO. Right. We do have some information uh, related to the crowdsource material already on the website. And we did a cursory uh, comb through of those recommendations. We didn't find real inconsistencies with them. Um, a lot of our pedestrian recommendations uh, that was generated out of just trying to get kids to school um, is not particularly included in the pedestrian recommendations on the, um, the website. But if any of you could spend some time looking at that information with respect to <coughs> the 24 projects that we've identified that we know we would like to see on the table, and then I welcome any and all other uh, discussions. We chose a particularly non-controversial uh, direction uh, for a variety of reasons. One, we wanted to make sure that it was a larger community because of the contentiousness of some of the previous project recommendations. Um, and we felt like it needed to be brought up as a, within the larger group. This document is really about something that we think we can get to consensus with. It's the, it's the it's the low-hanging fruit. And so I think we've completed that part of our mission that started before COVID. So I think this concept of, all right, well, this is, this is the low-hanging fruit. And then if other people want to offer and suggest, um, welcome to it. Then we can discuss that. But I would rather well, see. When you say suggest to your committee or to the full committee? Well. I mean, it, it, it's your committee at all interested or willing to take on those controversial projects? You know? I'm gonna speak for some of us in the committee, okay. um, but I think the other committee members need to speak up for themselves. But I think it puts the BISD demographers report right in the hairline, um, the target zone, if we go into deeper controversy, and I don't wanna do that to the district. They've been very generous with the information that they provided us. Um, I don't think a committee of five people primarily is suitable for that task. Okay. We've had 20 years, two decades of large scale projects shut down by the county citizens. And I just don't think five people, um, myself included, need to overstep that community um, interest or preference. So I think it needs to be the, a common table talk here. So we as a collective larger group then can put forward, unfortunately not controversial typically means <coughs> not very bold, not very visionary, not moving the, need the needle much. So if this is the larger group, you're looking for the larger group, it's to come up with some, I wouldn't say controversial, but bolder, more grander, more visionary projects? I would safely say yeah. Okay. You guys that sit on the committee, what are you thinking? I mean, I know Jeff represents the city with a transportation plan. Don't worry, <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and rightfully so. So he's got a bigger, grander vision. And we've, we've looked at that and concur with a lot of the things that he has seeing on the map so far. John Hyde has a different vision. 
he likes, he likes <coughs> chewing up countryside, you know, because that's, that's what textile does. So if you want to call it a vision or a grander, you know, go, go for it. But, well, yeah. I'm not, but I'm not I calling am. it chewing up countryside, but I am thinking that there might be some projects that are bigger in scope than perhaps what your five-person subcommittee was willing to recommend. No doubt. And then you're willing as a subcommittee, though, to entertain those from the larger collective group as a whole. I don't think the subcommittee needs to be the arbiter of, okay. of the larger, grander projects. I think that needs to be done here at this time. That's why we all get paid the bigger money. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, to put things in, in, a, in a different way of explaining that might be, if you looked at the 2007 report, there was quote old stuff, but a lot of little, little things in there too. And I think that the focus behind this committee's work was how do we mitigate traffic locally with local solutions, absent a regional approach. I think it was a much more localized approach. It is. Um, and that's why there's so much in there. There's a section on pedestrian because hey, we never took a look at pedestrian and we are, because when you look at certain neighborhoods that are so close to schools, yet buses and cars go out on the roads because there's not a good pedestrian navigation system, boy, we're just, we're adding to our own problem. We could solve it more easily. So there's a lot of those kinds of things in there. Okay. That makes sense. Is that right? Is that it is, and, and I, would, I would venture to say that if you, if you think in terms of bold <coughs> brand, People, and I've lived in cities, and I know you have too, that have loops and multiple loops. And I'm, I'm presuming that that's what you're talking about. But it doesn't get me to the grocery store, and it doesn't get these guys to their schools, and it doesn't get anybody to their gym. So those, those, that connectivity within our city is still going to be vital, whether we have a big project that interconnects the region or circles the city, or provides a new venue for commercial activity for the city, we still need that connectivity. So I, th I think there are two separate goals here. One, one is we still need to get across town. I mean, I still need to get over to HEB and my doctors and my gym, uh, and so do you and everybody else. And one of our members, it took him 30 minutes to go across to pick up a kid and drop them back up, 30 minutes in this community. That's a lot of time, you know, for a very short distance. So I think this report is about that. And then the other topic comes up and that's where I think we all need to have that. Okay, but I, just to, to be clear, our original charge, there were three things. One was a short-term a, a short plan, a short-range <coughs> plan, a project that could be done relatively easily. Uh, and that it would address current congestion. The second was a long-range plan of projects that would address future congestion and mobility. And the third was a recommended set of policies that would, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but basically facilitate the development of our transportation and land development in the county in a way that was consistent with our, our values in the county. That going to be through the legislature? Not necessarily, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that later, but there are three specific components in the corridor that, that we were given as a charge. So uh, I think the work y'all are doing clearly is focused on that, that initial low-hanging fruit, which is a little different than the first com projects committee, which was basically all-inclusive. So I just, for, for my own clarity, of, thought and for every other committees there, I want to make sure we understand how it is we bring other projects to the table that don't necessarily fit in that. So um, the other, so is that, uh, you are meeting tomorrow, correct? That's correct. And, and this is kind of a segue into the AMPO progress. Um, Cecilio, as you recall, last time I reported that he was interested in developing a proof of concept, organizing the crowdsource data into something that he would come present to us. He called me Sunday uh, afternoon and said, Don, I'm running late. I'm not gonna be ready to present this, but I would like to present it to the GIS slash projects committee on Tuesday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday, excuse me. 
Um, and I said, well, let me check with Bitsy, and I uh, did that, and Bitsy said that'd be great. So I know, Jonah, you're interested. I don't know if you can make it tomorrow. Is that 10 o'clock? Is that 10, Bitsy? It is 10. It's at the so, ASC School Administration office on John's Road. Anybody that's interested in how that data is reported out of the crowdsourcing, I'd encourage you to try to attend that meeting. I'm going to be there. Um, and he has said he would try to get it back to the full committee then uh, based on the feedback. Uh, tomorrow I'll get it back at the next meeting, which will be the 17th. So we're making progress, not as fast as we'd like. You know, one other thing I would add to what Vincent shared was we did discuss some larger projects, but really, and I agree with you, felt that that was a purview of the entire committee as opposed to, like she mentioned, the five. What was the information we used the most, um, and Jeff was helpful in putting it together on a map, but we looked at the 86 planning units that constitute uh, Burning ISD, little sections of the district, southwest, northwest, northeast, southeast. Um, now, not all of that is in Kennel County, there's some in Bear County, there's Fair Oaks, Bear County, but then there's the area in Bear County outside of Fair Oaks. But whatever happens in those planning units affects Bernie and affects Kendall County. So we really looked at all 86 planning units, um, the number of housing units that suspected over a five year period, over a 10 year period, and basically said, hey, what, what makes sense from a road and a pedestrian point of view in these areas? So we really broke it down Actually, in the Northeast, we broke it down into the city of Bernie, we broke it down into the Bergheim area, the Esperanza area. So really saying, okay, in these, each of these areas, what needs to be done to facilitate better mobility? And that, was, that was the guiding thing, really. And the heaviest need actually is in the Southeast and the Southwest. Right. And there's an opportunity there with that new um, I-10 interchange of Balcones Creek uh, which would be new roads and the most immediate pressure on the county in terms of the transportation system. Um, so again, I, I, I defer to, to definitively state what the plan is, except to note in particular that that area warrants a, a closer inspection <coughs> because we have development going in. If you connect through there, that relieves the pressure off of Cascade Caverns Road intersection it mitigates some of the blockage there at the county line where Balcones Creek crosses and orders up traffic, um, you know, up and down, north and south. So having a way that you can connect. And then on the, the west side of I-10 in that same general area, um, the Alamo Area College District is going in, and there are multiple roads that have been proposed that are under application that interconnects a lot of that and, and brings traffic further south into Bear County and further north into Kendall County. So we, we really saw the more imminent decade, you know, time frame um, in that area. And that's probably the heaviest area that we looked at. Um, some of the other areas um, aren't going to have that kind of pressure. The northwest is not, and the northeast to a great extent is not, until you get to the regional conversation. <coughs> likely to happen uh, from a school district perspective over the next decade with the construction of school sites, uh, you're going to find an increased effort to keep students who live west of, four, uh, west of Interstate 10 and south of 46 in that quadrant of the school district because right now there's a lot of buses and a lot of cars that cross over on Interstate 10 and there's just not a lot of crossover places. And uh, whether it's the next elementary school that will likely, that hopefully will be built, you know, in the next two, three years, west of Interstate 10 to be followed by other schools. Because when you look at the expected growth of housing, you're going to have another Bernie city population south of 46, west of Interstate 10 within 15 years. You're, you're going to have that. So you need the infrastructure and you need the schools to go along with it so that you're not clogging up downtown Bernie. So hopefully the school district can be part of the solution to keeping school traffic localized in the area closest to where people live. Yeah, Don, I 
you know, just listen to this conversation. I think it's all very healthy. We are all we're feeling the crunch time coming on us, so let's, let's have some deliverables prepared. <clears throat> Tomorrow morning's, uh, I hope Cecilio can make his presentation tomorrow. I hope it's worth, I hope it's finished. I hope he's mm -hmm. able to actually have compile some useful crowdsourcing feedback because the charge of this committee to me is profoundly was to be the voice of the community rather than the voice of some outside agency or a consultant. And crowdsourcing is the validation of, in my mind, of our recommendations that we send to our sponsoring governmental bodies that are the decision makers. Much more so in my mind than traffic count data or detailed cost estimates to back it up. It's that this is what our report to me says, here's what the community has to say about mobility issues, road, pedestrian, pathways, policies. Uh, that's kind of how I see, I think it's real important that the crowdsourcing data be analyzed and used at some level. If it's going to be too much of a slog for it to be a detailed quantitative analysis that's definitive in a court of law, then maybe we need to back off and just have more of a gut feel of, all right, here, we all know this is what crowdsourcing said about the intersection of plant mess or what, you know, whatever. You've alluded a couple of times to something that, that, Rich, I really want to hear from you about. I don't want to put BISD in any kind of a weird political position, but by the same token, some of the most powerful <laughs> policy discussions coming out of your demographic work came from you guys about. Yeah, I don't. I don't. don't think, I don't think we were in any difficult political position at all. I don't. I, don't, I didn't get that feeling. Uh, in fact, uh, both John Ramirez and Henry Acosta were valuable members of the subcommittee in providing information where the choke points are right now. And, and look, we're all on the same team, and we want to minimize traffic pr problems in our communities. I didn't, I didn't feel that way. Well, I, let, me, let me be specific. We all know that there are some neighborhoods in our community that are not interconnected, and that damn sure don't want to be. Yeah. And that we also know as members of this committee that they need to be. They ought to be. And it would be a mobility solution if it were. So uh, that would be crunch time. I mean, we as a committee, if you don't know it, I'm going to tell you, we're going to catch some heat when we go real with recommendations. We're just going. We've got to feel like we're doing the right thing. And I just hope that those kinds of conversations that BISD is not feeling like we've done something untoward or putting you in a unnecessary. I think it's kids' safety, it's traffic congestion. There's a hundred reasons why you would stick to your position, but I don't understand the politics behind it. But I just, I just want to get that said. I think your input's been amazingly valuable, and I hope we don't want to do anything that you would regret. I would concur, and hopefully, if we're getting close to that point, you would, I'm sure you would let us know. And I'd like to just add I think um, two things. I think you can make significant, large scale change with lots of small tweaks. I think that's, that's just as a general statement, system, working with systems, you shouldn't undervalue the importance of looking at the whole system and fixing a lot of the inefficiencies. I think there's a really valuable work there, just if we take the time to do all the small projects. Um, not to say we shouldn't also consider the other ones, but just as a broad statement, I wanted to say that. Um, on the work with Cecilio, I just also wanted to update, I can't, exactly recall when we had our phone meeting with him. Was that after the last meeting? No, it was before. It was before, okay, so because yeah. I, I, I couldn't recall if we updated people on that, but they provided all the data to us. Um, and I'll just say that I did have some time to look through that data. I was able to load it up on my computer and I spent all of 15 minutes trying to play with it a little bit. So I mean, there, there, it is possible, like I have access to it, we have all the data. Um, and, and I kind of came to the same conclusion as Cecilio that it was like, oh, this is going to be a little bit slow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty much going to be, I think, sort of looking at the map and drawing your own feature and adding some information that goes with that to summarize all those other features. Yeah. Um, 
And there's a lot of them. You know, there's like a couple hundred of those. So I, I would think it'd be a few days of work. I don't have that kind of uh, time availability, but in the, in the time I've worked on, that was my conclusion. So yeah, I'll, I'll plan on being there Great. tomorrow. Um, I, I would like to put pressure on the, on the school district. <laughs> Honestly, like, I get, I get this sort of sensitivity thing, but at the same time, you know, I know that I, I consider schools to be amenities, like amenities that are highly desirable to have as close to your home as possible. And um, certainly when it comes to mobility solutions and trying to have options, obviously kids are, can be some of the greatest beneficiaries of non-vehicular mobility. And so I do wonder still, and I think I've said this before, but I'm gonna say louder and bolder, which is I do wonder if there's a role for the, the, the school district to have some amount of, of uh, policy that's, that's directed around making sure that, that, that any development that's buying for the school to be in there, or even wants to say, hey, look, we're gonna reserve land for your school, would also be asked to provide the mobility network that feeds that school rather than us come back and retrofit it later because it's all built around car-based mobility. You understand? Is that too vague? No, I think it's actually, some of the recommendations of the 24 reflect that. Awesome. And I, think, I think the city of Bernie has some strong Yeah, I, I uh, think I would, if yeah. someone showed up to permit public school or private school or any school, our traffic ordinance is such a way that any trip peak hour trip greater than 50, which every school is, would have to do a two mile traffic study of every intersection within two miles. And if they're lowering the classification of that intersection, they'll have to make improvements to it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what our ordinance is for any entity, including public students. Right, and the ETA. Even, yeah. Well, and, and okay, that's awesome now. What I'm also playing at though is, again, so I, we always talk about thoroughfare plans. Yeah. Of course, it's all about the vehicles, right? Yeah. So, cars that you get them. That's what, that's what, that's the only thing that really matters, right? It's like, well, wait a minute. There's other mobility that can matter if we are willing to prioritize it. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, through, through policy. Yeah. Is that, that's where, and we had the conversation with the Lid Apartments the other day as a perfect example. It's not a school, but a senior apartment complex went in and they only had to build their little sidewalk right to the project. But we don't have anything in our ordinance that makes them connect their project to the rest of the city for the sidewalk system so that those seniors could actually go walk somewhere and burn. And yet on the southwest side, Big Horn or Wicked mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 3, has some <coughs> uh, provisions for providing a walking path right. from, from there to the school, proposed school. So, I mean, they, there are some tools there. County, I don't know. I don't, I don't think we have the, the tools, but uh, you know, the regulatory tools Certainly, we can offer encouragement to do that. I mean, I think, in my opinion, as a commissioner, as a Kansas County citizen, what I'd like to do is create an ethos within the within the county that is these are desirable places to live. You put that stuff there because that enhances the product, your housing product, your development, uh, and gives you a leg up over somebody who doesn't provide the amenities. And it just makes things so much easier. It becomes a standard part of what we do. Don, would that be incorporated in the third phase of what you talked about yes. a moment ago about right. establishing standards and policies? That's the way I see it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, any other closing remarks on that? We appreciate again the work of the Projects GIS Committee, and look forward to your continuing input and. Uh, we can hopefully get that into a format that we can, you know, tangibly bind into a report that's meaningful and meets your group. So then, when our next step is to start working on PowerPoint that usually puts all of this together, but is that something that we want to do after people have had a chance to propose different things? Or do you, you know, because we're going to ask some, I mean, we've got one member who's off the and he's not here today, so I can't speak for his time, but um, we don't have a deep pool of resources there. Um, I don't know, Jeff, how your department is positioned to offer help or not. Uh, we, we have a utility GIS person that can do utility stuff to get into other maps and other kind of stuff. That's not what he really does. And it's, um, he's booked up weeks in advance right now, so it's really, it's a 
timing deal here telling me you needed something six months from now. I guess I'm probably that, but yeah, you need it two weeks from now, probably I don't have a map card for that. Well, I, and John Kite has a lot of resources that way too. Um, you know, we're just putting these, these schematics together in terms of, in, on this section of Cascade Cabinets Road, we're recommending uh, projects one through five, and we'd like to, to pull a map up of Cascade Cabinets Road and that kind of thing. I think is, if you have that ready to go to where somebody uh, from your committee or members of your committee could sit down with a person at some point in time and just walk through those projects on a project by project basis, just continue to accumulate that data. Uh, I think that we are probably going to meet the mayor and the county judge and the mayor of Fair Oaks sometime within the next couple of weeks uh, and uh, talk about what we need. Actually, I think we can do that right now. Okay, well, I'd say go ahead and proceed. We may no, ask no, you. I'm, what I'm saying is I can sit with someone and okay. right. walk through the recommendations that someone right now it has been sort of out of touch, so okay. um, we could use that person today. Okay. Yeah, to give to give relief for him or backup for him, whichever one he needs. As soon as we identify a resource and get it funded, we'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, it will be soon. Anybody else want to offer? I can help you out a little bit. I thought that was uh, what's his name. I thought he wanted to do it, so I did. So, okay. Yeah. Well, good. So we've got a volunteer. Okay. Uh, let's hear it for Steve. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm any good at it, but I can help you with it. Thank you, Steve. Um, we, you know, you look at uh, the uh, the calendar, and you realize we have uh, nine more meetings in 2021. That doesn't seem like a lot of meetings to go to achieve what. I hope this report looks like. And so I spent some time, what I call getting up on the balcony, in thinking about where we are and what we're doing, what we're not doing. And so I wanna, I wanna share my balcony experience with you. So if you'll indulge me, um, and then we can discuss that afterwards. Uh, you know, we started this committee as a matter of review in the late summer of fall of 2019. We had, I think we've laid a good foundation to comprehensively address the congestion and mobility issues in this county. I think every major constituent group in the county has been represented. And as a committee, we've committed, to our, committed ourselves to citizen-based solutions, to transparency, and to complete conversations, to use my co-chair's uh, terminology. And I think those are good things. Along the way, we've developed a great website to facilitate public engagement. Uh, the engagement committee did some great work getting out flyers and making people aware of that. We have gathered a significant amount of information that ranges uh, from the detailed technical information of the how the Alamo area MPO uh, projects travel demand to how BISD projects its student population growth and related overall population growth. We've looked at the effectiveness of roundabouts and wide nodes and narrow roads and we've done a lot of uh, education of our committee. Um, and I think Generally, we were making really good progress in developing, bless you, a list of short-term projects as we moved into early 2020. But then COVID hit and we suspended our meetings in the spring of 2020. The only substantive activity we did during that one year suspension was that an ad hoc committee developed a list of short-term recommendations at the request of the county and the city that, that, that might inform their responses to potential, or potential responses to a call for projects made by the MPO. During the interim, in that one year, we lost not only members, but we lost momentum. When we attempted to restart the process earlier this year, uh, I would say the response 
from all of us was closer to apathetic than enthusiastic. Um, we, um, we, I think, have started moving slowly towards our goal, but I'm compelled to tell you that I think with our current trajectory and our pace, we are probably not going to produce the kind of report that I had hoped we would produce. Some of the problems that I see is that I think we're doing some uh, not inconsequential amount of wishful thinking. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I think that's human nature. I think we're hoping that we're gonna find some innovative ideas and some tweaks in some of these little, you know, the short-term projects and that that is going to solve our, our problems. Um, I, so I think wishful thinking has, has been a, a problem. Um, I think our approaches, our ideas and conversations have been, for the most part, qualitative. We characterized our conversations by, well, we can reduce a lot of traffic by X, Y, Z, or there's not much. And we don't really have detailed uh, data that really supports our assessments and I think drives um, uh, drives our decision making doesn't mean it has to be the only I mean we, I think it's good that we have qualitative conversations and discussions but that can't just be all if we want our report really to make a difference and I think um, worst of all we probably avoided some really difficult conversations about major thoroughfares major thoroughfare alignments and land acquisition that's needed in order to implement some of those bolder projects. Doesn't mean we have to propose 300 foot wide rights of way, but I think we need to somehow discuss if you're gonna at some point in time have this roadway carry X number of cars, you're probably gonna need to add 10 or 15 feet on either side. And we need to come to grips with that and to say, we ain't gonna do that here, or we are gonna do that here, it's needed. We, we just need to say that. <clears throat> and so we need to have the conversation about it, let both sides be heard and say their piece, and then we'll vote. Or maybe we'll have consensus. Um, to the extent that I haven't provided more effective leadership, I acknowledge and accept my role in our current situation. So in an effort to illuminate our target for this group and hopefully improve our aim and our pace and our trajectory, I've offered a draft outline of our final report. I said, here's, here's what we're gonna do. It's the last two pages of your agenda. And this is a draft, it's, it's for you to consider and to discuss and hopefully frame our progress uh, uh, and, and efforts to get back on track. So I'd like to walk through that agenda with you or that outline or that table of contents and then get your feedback on that. Again, this is nothing set in stone and it is a straw man for y'all to, to, uh, to critique. Now, the introduction, basically this is just sort of the boilerplate, why we're doing this, what our purpose is, the court order verbiage, who's done this work, who they represent, all that stuff. Uh, we have a background section that talks about Kendall County's background, the kind of culture that we have here, rural transitioning, at least partly transitioning into urban, suburban. Talk about um, just things that are unique to Kendall County, the Edwards Plateau area, just you know, what is it that makes Kendall County, Kendall County? I think we need to talk about our county transportation system. I've heard that word used a couple of times. We need to talk about who owns the system. You know, text, it's, it's jointly owned by TxDOT, the city, the county. And so, you know, we need, to, we need to recognize that in the transportation plan. I think we need to recognize the modes of transportation that exist and those that don't exist, which I agree with Ben on a lot of stuff. Um, I think it's good that we recognize prior transportation planning history. And Northern's done a great job in 
in already putting that together on our website, and I think we don't need to go into great detail, but I think we need to maybe <clears throat> pull from each of those some tidbits that help people understand why we're making some recommendations and why we're make, not making other recommendations. Um, I think we need to discuss Kendall County's uh, situate, uh, how it's situated in a regional context. We can talk just about us, you know, what, 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 how we're affected, but the fact of the matter is we are next to a large urban area. And we get a lot of traffic that comes through here. Some on, a lot on I-10 and some on 46. And that affects our transportation study. And if we ignore those effects, I think we, we don't have a complete transportation study. I think we do need to have some technical foundation to our report. We have a lot of demographics. Uh, you know, the state demographer has said we're gonna double in population but the, the Bernie ISD has done a great service and said, it's one thing to double uniformly throughout the county, but what the, the problem is the, the intensity of the density in, in the southern part of Kendall County, that's where the population's gonna grow. Now the question I have in my mind is if we take all of BISD's growth projections and we lay them over the demographer study, does it double in? I mean, are we gonna replicate the state demographer's results? How do they correlate with the population projections that AMCO uses? And I think we need to, to delve into that a little bit, and if it's disconnected, that's fine. Let's just say it's disconnected, and maybe we can suggest a reconciliation, a resolution. I do think we need to include some traffic counts. I, I mean, I, it's not that we're vehicle-centric, Ben, but they're important. <laughs> oh, I'm not disputing that for a second. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we haven't gotten traffic counts, we've talked about it, but, you know, school's not in session, and we had a significant uh, decline in traffic. Now, I've had the uh, good fortune to work with another consultant who did some traffic counts in response to a fatality we had in Comfort uh, earlier this year. And TxDOT did the study, and they tra counted the traffic, and interestingly enough, the 2019 traffic data that they counted was a certain number. The 2020 traffic count was way down. Okay, the 2021 traffic counts are up from 2020, but still below 2019. So what is the appropriate use of that data? Do we count again in 2022, or do we, I mean, what they have suggested is that for their planning purposes, they're going to multiply the 2019 data by 15% on traffic counts and use that for planning purposes. That may, you know, I think we need to discuss that, decide if that's appropriate, or if we use 10%, or we don't make any adjustment, but let's at least have some technical underpinning. <clears throat> I think we ought to talk about, not in a critical way, but an important way about the influence of primary and secondary school traffic. And it's not just BISD. I mean, Geneva has a big driver down there too. But schools are a, a, a driver of traffic and I think we need to recognize that. And I think that supports some of the recommendations, particularly the short-term connectivity recommendations that we make that we can make some immediate impacts. Um, you know, uh, the EDC uh, here in Kendall County has made, I think, great progress. Uh, I think in large part because Ben Eldridge was, uh, had the, enough foresight to bring in some people that said, let's do some planning uh, EDC that looks at not just economic development in terms of jobs. Let's talk about why do people want to move here? And so, is it IC squared? Uh, it but was, uh, Johnson School of Economics, I believe. Yeah. But, the, but the recommendations that the EDC has brought forward for their strategic plan, for the, what they adopted, uh, is the first time I've seen the strategic e economic development plan recognize that the quality of life here is a significant economic development tool. And that the quality of life
life has to do a lot with the environment and the open space and the, and, and the, those things that we kind of take for granted. And I think they're beginning to say, oh, we got something special here. We can, we need to take care of this. So I think we need to include that. And Steve is here from the Economic Development uh, Commission, and so Steve, you can you know help us with that. Uh, then we get into the meat and potatoes, and the potatoes part is the short range program. You know, we need to talk about what we're trying to do, address short range things, particularly improving pedestrian safety. There may be other goals that we want to address through the short range plan. And then we need a list of projects. Uh, and those projects, and I think you all have started on this already, they textile projects, they're city projects, they're county projects, and city of Fair Oaks projects, you know. What, what can you all do to help implement this? And then you get into the meat part of this, Tim, where we have the long range program. Those things that address the future congestion, like what's gonna happen on 46 out here when Mira Lomas is completely full and we have another city the size of Bernie down here. What is 46 gonna look like? Do we want a connector down through the Cibolo corridor? Or do we wanna push all that traffic to 3351, and if we did that, what would 3351 look like? And what do we have to do in terms of cooperation with Fair County? So I think we need to look at that. We need to talk about how do we preserve the rural character of rural Kendall County? We've talked mostly about this area, you know, a line that's three miles north of Highway 46, uh, south of that, you know, north of that is pretty rural still. Maybe we want to keep it that way. Do we say that our recommendation is that we avoid putting any four-lane highways through there or converting any farm-to-market roads to four-lane roads? Or what, do we, what do we say about that? For long term, I think we ought to make a statement. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of talk about um, efforts to avoid creating latent traffic demand, you know, building roads in ways having policies about those roads that encourage development, which then fill the roads up and require more roads, and pretty soon you're just chasing your tail. I think we need to make some statements about that. Again, we'll have a list of projects that, you know, TxDOT already has a long-range plan. It's called the TIP, STIP, and we at least need to acknowledge that within the context of our transportation report. Uh, I think the city of Bernie has some at least rudimentary plans for how they'd like to see things go in the next next few years. Uh, the county doesn't have any. Fair Oaks, I don't know. <clears throat> um, and then we get into the to the icing on the cake, which is the policy recommendations. You know, what do we do to preserve our hill country environment? What do we do about transportation design? What do we do about um, you know, access management. What do we do, how do we control residential density? If we can't control it, let's say we can't control it and that we need to have the legislature step up and do it if that's what we feel like. Just because we say it needs to happen doesn't mean it will, but it doesn't keep us from saying it, it ought to. We can talk about interconnectivity between developments and how that ought to be incorporated into policies at both the city and the county levels. And then I think there's a whole nother set of recommendations that we ought to make about uh, things like coordinating the geometric standards for rights of way and roadways between the city and the county. Um, Y'all probably have about like, six or eight different roadway classifications. Ten. Ten. I think the county's got two or three. And I don't think any of them match up <laughs> with each other. So you're in this ETJ, I mean, I mean, we're three blocks from each other, why is it that we can't have a coordinated set of, does that make sense? <laughs> Should. Um, so that's a recommendation. I think we should have coordinated major thoroughfare plans. I think we need to have uh, address pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and I don't think it's too bold to say we ought to have a countywide bicycle mobility plan. I mean, there are a lot of people that come to Kendall County to go biking. I mean, if you don't think so, just come to my house on uh, in the springtime 
you'll see Seth Mitchell go by there about 40 times, you know, and Lance Armstrong's right behind him trying to get him. But um, sidewalks, somebody was talking about sidewalks. What do we need to do about sidewalks? How do we make those serve the people better? And then I think we need an acknowledgement section, you know, BISD, not just for their hospitality uh, and, and letting us meet there for almost a year, but also the great work that's uh, embodied in their demographic studies. Uh, the city of Bernie hospitality, not to mention our scribe of extraordinaire over here. Uh, AMPO uh, has done, and I think will continue to do a lot of work for us. And of course, we need to acknowledge the presenters, and I've only listed two of them here, the guy from Carmel, Indiana, Dr. George Benny, and we had some last week, Amy Avery, and I'm sure we'll have some more. So that's my um, that's my outline for the report, and we have uh, nine meetings to get this done. Now I'm not one to um, hurry up and do it um, halfway. I would prefer we take a little longer and do a really good job, because if we don't do a really good job. This will just be added to the list that Northern has of another study in the <laughs> transportation planning history that can be referred to by the next committee. I, uh, I feel strongly about this. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a story I told Bob earlier about, and I, I started out with Bob and Larry, so I'm gonna stick with that, but the fact that it's Bob is not any reference or any reflection on Bob. But Bob and Larry were brothers-in-law. And Bob was a great fisherman. And he always went fishing. And he always came back with tons of fish. And Larry was the game warden in that county. And he just could not figure out how Bob was catching all these fish. And so he said, Bob, I need you to take me and show me how you do this. So sure, I'll pick you up Saturday morning, they picked him up. Went out to the lake, got the boat, went out in the middle of the lake. Bob opened his tackle box, pulled out a stick of dynamite, lit it through it in the water. <coughs> went around scooping up all the fish. Larry says, hey, Bob, I'm a game warden. You can't do this. He says, Ma, you want to know how to catch fish? This is how I catch fish. As he took another stick of dynamite, lit it through it in the water. <coughs> went and picked up all the fish. And Larry says, Bob, Look, I, I know I'm your brother-in-law, but I'm the game warden, and I'm going to have to cite you and take you in. And Bob said, no, Larry, I don't think so. As he took another stick of dynamite, and he lit it, and he put it in Larry's lap. He said, are you going to fish or are you going to fuss? <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story is we're all in this boat together, every one of us in Kendall County and every one of us on this committee. And I don't want this to blow up in our face. So... With that, I'm going to be quiet and take notes. With that, I'm going to put the stick of dynamite in all your lives. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don, thank you for taking the time to put that together. I thought that was I mean, a really important foundation for us moving forward. I took a couple of notes about items that are maybe additions, things that are, or questions about where things might go. Um, so I was wondering if under technical foundations, if that would be a place to insert something about, uh, you know, we've learned a lot during this committee about certain design ideas, certain retrofits, and whether it be the right sizing of a road, or whether it be a roundabout, or the wide nose, narrow roads concept. Something about general concepts and, and things that we've learned that help provide us some technical foundation for some of the recommendations that we are giving. I don't know if that's appropriate to include something like that there. Um, and then under policy recommendations, there are some thoughts that I've had. I think that I think that when it comes to larger roads and thoroughfares, that um, for some individuals, myself probably included, it's less about the development of a road than it is about how the road is developed. Um, and if, if we were to recommend that we think that there needs to be a road in this area, 
but it would be the land would be acquired through development agreements with developers as properties are developed, things like that. We're not coming in there with black helicopters and bulldozing people's houses and, and, and taking away people's land. That would be a fundamentally different approach. And so what I was wondering is if there might be something in, in the policy recommendations regarding land acquisition that we might put in there. It's like if land acquisition is gonna happen, the committee recommends these types of approaches and, and, and versus these other kinds that we do not support or recommend. Um, and then, you know, another thought just on policy recommendations was regarding, um, I think, I think uh, early on in the development of the committee, we talked about some broad concepts or principles that would help drive some of our, our, our decision making. And one of those would be things like, you know, in the development of a road, Obviously, if you can develop it in two different ways, and everything else is the same, but one does less environmental damage than the other, then we prefer that one. And if one is less expensive than the other, then we prefer that one. So there's certain things that are like concepts of things that we prefer. I don't know if that would fit under there. And then lastly, under- uh, no, Before you leave that, yes, please. explain to me. I mean, give me something I can do. Yeah, so I was thinking about, uh, um, general principles or concepts about things that, that when we are faced with a transportation decision, these are the things we want to minimize and these are the things we generally want to maximize. For example? For example, we want to minimize environmental damage. We want to minimize loss of beautiful landscapes and scenic areas that are important to the community. We want to minimize, you know, other, you know, cost of the project. There's a variety of things and competing values that end up going into any of these sorts of things. You're kind of talking guiding principles. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Or that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then very lastly, just um, under pedestrian infrastructure, I just put a little note there about walking trails. May, it might be in addition to sidewalks. Like we have the Greenway, mm -hmm. and oftentimes when I think of a sidewalk, I think of a little strip of pavement or concrete next to this, the road, and maybe sort of uh, making it a little more inclusive. Those are my. So otherwise, I, I mean, not even otherwise. I think this is a great start, and it gets us really pointing in the boat in the right direction. And that's, those are all my comments. Touch upon that very last about the uh, uh, the walkways and the bicycle trails and whatnot. The, the, I think we should point out that there's really two different functions there. At least two different functions. One is as it as it relates to mobility and people being able to get from home to school or home to work as a mode of transportation and using a bike for walking versus the health and recreational aspect of it and riding by Don's house every Saturday morning uh, to go up and down the hill. So the, the, the walking trails and the bike trails are one aspect of that and have a different developmental purpose than building walkways from the apartment complex the schools and the apartment complex, the shopping malls we get with them. And so how that's identified within those recommendations. Okay. Um, one thing, as, as you started, and you talked about our enthusiasm a year and a half ago versus coming back after uh, uh, the COVID issues, you know, we had some, we, we, we were dealing with a very specific timeline related to bond referendums that we, we've seen the loss. And it would be helpful to know what the political thinking is in terms of referendums. I think that that gave us somewhat of a focus, or at least it gave me somewhat of a focus on here's an artificial deadline. We want to have a November referendum, so we need to get back and get some real projects to get to the city or the county in May. And, and, and that was kind of a driving force. And, and we somewhat have lost that driving force because we're throwing some projects out there. And we don't know where they're going within those public entities and what they're thinking. Um, I mean, I, I think we have a, a sense of, you know, BISD, as a, a 
significant bond issue coming forward. And I know that Mayor Hendren has talked about the potential for the bond issues uh, before COVID and has talked about it since then. But in all the, and I'm not attributing this to Mayor Hendren, but in all the other conversations that I've had, I think that conventional wisdom is you can't have two major bond issues at the same time or they both fail. And that sets the whole process back further. So uh, I think we can validate uh, those, that conventional wisdom with the political subdivisions, but I agree with you. There, there is no, no compelling deadline other than uh, the fact that the political context in which we exist is in a constant state of flux. Mayors and county judges come and go, city council members and commissioners courts come and go, and the relatively good support I think we enjoy now may not always exist, and so we need to make hay while the sun shines. Well, at the same time, we I, I didn't sign up as a lifetime commitment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. It depends on how long our lives are here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you said. <laughs> you're out of board. Um, but in that regard, though, that it, it might be helpful to all agree on what we consider short-term and what we consider long-term. Yeah. And, and to, to some of the short-term could be out 10 years, mm -hmm. long-term could be 40 or 50 years. Yeah. And others may look at that. I think, as a group, we should probably decide. I, I think that's good. Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll say is once the presentation from the committee that this chair is put forth, I think it's going to really generate additional discussion on more major things because you're going to see maps of the area with where the low hanging fruit or what have you is presented, where the pedestrian improvements are presented. But then it begs the question, well, if you're going to have X number of housing units over a decade or 15 years going in this area, what else could be beyond that? And I think that will set the stage for those discussions with the larger group. But I think it's, to her point earlier, it's important that the entire group be knowledgeable of the processes we use so they can say, okay, where do we go from here? Um, because I, I think what, what this subcommittee did was really handle and I don't want to say the little stuff, because to your point, John, I think you're right. You know, you do enough small improvements here and there, it can have a dramatic impact. So, um, but I don't think anyone on our committee <coughs> would say this is a 2040 or 2050 plan. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have one thing, and I don't know where it would fit in here. Um, Mayor Hendren mentioned that the section in there that says, or section of road costs this much to construct and it costs this much to maintain it for the next 20 years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to know how much your, our current maintenance budget is costing. Not for that. I mean, we could have a little bit of a cost, but it wouldn't have to be that complicated by a I, I think that's a, a, a doable thing. I know the mayor has suggested that we not worry about cost, but um, John Kite is, will be the first to tell you you have to prioritize, and how can you prioritize unless you at least consider a range of magnitude costs? Yeah. That's people that look at this go, oh, I want all of these, yeah. and then we'll okay, this is what's going to be your property taxes, and then. <coughs> no, the question that what you're talking about is, yeah, we need to do it. A lot of times they'll say, well, this type road costs five million dollars a mile. Okay, what's that going to do to your taxes? In other words, equate all of what you're talking. That helps you make the decision. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the considerations. Mm -hmm. So, um, a couple of things. As I'm looking at your plan, and by the way, thank you for putting this together. I think um, I think it sets the stage for the creation of the report. Um, so much of the first part of it, um, it seems like we can do concurrently with the conversations 
about the long range plans. Um, I think some of the technical foundation that I would find very useful is given the uh, recommendations that we've made and given what we know about traffic counts, how does it change the distribution of traffic if you implement these, um, I call them the, the Samson and Goliath changes. You know, that was a fairly effective small strategy success, you know, where um, the little guy um, just had persistence and, and a little bit of savvy and overcame the big giant. So, but I think you could proof, and, and when you said AMPO could do proof of concept, my mind went there. What, what if you did these things? How would that impact? Well, I, I will give you my understanding. And Sharma, if I'm misspeaking, then tell me so, to, or Bobby, you, you, Joe, you, you all might know better than me. As I understand it, AMPO's travel demand model, uh, the county or their whole area is broken into travel uh, transportation analysis zones, not unlike county uh, census precincts. And there are certain attributes for each of those zones, significantly population, uh, income, age uh, distribution, and things like that. And they use that, those demographics together with historical information from, you know, that they've gathered through the years to project travel demand on certain roads. Now their travel, their, their transportation network doesn't include every road in Kendall County. It just includes certain major roads. And so they project travel demands and then they look at what, actually I think then they go and they compare the current projected travel demand on a road and they do a traffic count and then they do their best to calibrate their travel demand model. And then they say, okay, well, we know that these areas are gonna grow in population and we think the demographic trends are such as X, Y, Z. This is the future travel demand. And the level of service on say Highway 46 maybe was a B under the current conditions. If we don't do anything, the level of service will fall to a D or an F. That's my understanding of how AMPO's travel demand model goes, it operates. And that it works really good for a great big area like AMPO, but where it doesn't really work is when you, you gather all these little incremental tweaks, or maybe it does. Y'all have any insight into that? You detail code that. AMPO model into this specific area of like a Bernie and the surrounding area, and you can get, it's never completely accurate. I mean, you're predicting stuff 20 years later, you know, but once you detail code that model, this sub-network almost of the bigger AMPO model, then it, it, it works, relatively speaking. But you'd have to go. It takes more quite a bit of effort. Things. It's a lot of effort yeah. to do that. Yeah. And, and I, I, I just don't see, I mean, how we can get there, Bitsy. So, Jeannie Geiger uh, and I had a conversation about this particular topic, and she mentioned something, and technically speaking, I, I don't have recall what that something was, but it sounded to me like it was a spaghetti model, you know, where you could look at, you know, you could look at traffic flows visually, not, not number-wise, but, um, so there's no way if you created these alternatives that you could you, you could image how it would impact. Say downtown Bernie is the key, you know, key thing that we're we're concerned about is we want to make sure that if anything that we have suggested will impact downtown Bernie traffic you in a could. positive way. You could on it's transcad, so you you code those links with traffic volumes and you can make them red and if that's what you're talking about it, you can detail that it, you're using the transcad model to do that and there's there's other softwares that are more for smaller segments like it's not transcad it's like what's called a decent model you can build the network but it's like you 
If you're talking about an operational analysis, they're talking about traffic forecast monitoring. Yeah, yeah. VSUM or understood what the tr like a trip analysis on Main Street in downtown Vernon could show us what what percent of that traffic is from is local origin and destination or no we're doing that we're going to get that up that street like that so okay. we're going to get what percentage of traffic is local through downtown you know off of I-10 or you know we will be able to get and that. then if it can it be interfaced with alternatives in other words if this is not in street light you would take that data into your transcad mm -hmm. as your calibration for your future year and then in transcad you can take off those links just as a what if if there was a kindle gateway or whatever that it's in, water it, in the bucket okay. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm just saying what if <laughs> and then it, yeah it can show you this is what your volume is and it's in the Kendall Gateway study. It's in the appendix of that report. Mm -hmm. If you build only the northeast segment, this is what traffic is in downtown. It's all in that appendix of that report. And I can show you that okay. too, because it's a couple years old, but it's public, it's out there, it's on the textile website. It's easy. Yeah. I, I do think that the, when we talk about the incremental, like, or I guess the smaller projects, in quote, um, I mean, if, if by smaller <coughs> projects what we mean is intersection retrofits or like redesigning intersections, that can also be a completely non trivial amount of money. That can mm -hmm. be hugely expensive. It can involve land acquisition, it can involve a whole lot of stuff, especially if we're doing a lot of intersection retrofits. But I think the um, that narrow roads, mm -hmm. wide nodes concept and what we learned from that presentation that I thought was really interesting was just how how that seems I mean it seems like the small roads can carry a lot of traffic was the lesson that I got from that right small roads can carry a whole lot of traffic it's those intersections that are the big problems so I just want I wanted to re, I, I was thinking about that and it occurred to me that you know while we say short term we think smaller projects they, I mean they, that's not a trivial project to build you know Ten giant intersection redesigns in a town, so that could still be pretty darn expensive. And and I also think that the modeling of that, which ties into what y'all were saying, is is that is an interesting and kind of comp because oftentimes a lot of it with these modeling efforts, we're just kind of thinking about road capacity and how much these different different roads can carry. And we're, um, at least from the, at the really basic level that we tend to think about it at this committee level is. Um, we're not really trained to think of it in terms of redesigning intersections to allow more capacity to reach. John, I want to tag on a little bit, maybe tie a couple of loose ends together. The, the idea <coughs> that we talked earlier about crowdsourcing data and the need to get that in a form where we're, it's supporting our recommendations and so we give a report that says, Put a round dollar up at Adler and School Street in Maine, and it's going to cost half a million dollars or whatever. It might give, so the same thing would apply to all 24 or 124 of them would agree with all, you know, whatever. If we were able to indicate the level of public support for each of these, and here's the cost and here's the impact on, on taxes, it might give our sponsoring agencies and the taxing authorities. The information they need and the messaging information they need to go back to their citizenry of bond elections to say, okay, we're going to carve out five of these a year and do them. And you guys said you wanted them, and here they are, here's what they cost, and here's how it's going to affect your taxes. But failing to say this is supported by the citizenry and community residents, I think we're back in the same trap that the last several attempts have fallen in. Who met behind closed doors and concocted this secret list? And so I just keep circling right back around so we need crowdsourcing data. I, and I like the idea of, a t I've talked against too much cost estimating and I'm guilty, but I want it to be, you know, for linear mile or uh, 
100 yards of sidewalk or a bike trail costs this much, all of this, and the average around the belt. Let's do much. these averages or rules of thumb because we're not going to hire an engineering consultant to do detailed design. And I don't think we need to, and we've certainly been told, don't do it. But I think we can do the, the rough estimate of what order of magnitude sort of costs and, and uh, have an indicator that way. But that's just my thoughts on what you're saying. Thank you. It depends on the classification of the roadway, as I understand it. I think farm to market roads, the county requires it. If it's a state highway, I think the state covers most of it. Um, you know, back to, I was thinking, I think your, your question about compelling deadlines. Um, there is an infrastructure bill moving through Congress right now. And the best guess that I, most of the stuff I've read says that the bipartisan bill, which includes a significant additional investment in, in surface transportation, uh, will pass sometime in October. And that it is possible that if we have projects that, that are pretty well defined and well supported by the public, that might, you know, I mean, that's an encouragement for us to move along. I kind of want to like <laughs> go with these transportation guys, like talk a little shop for a second. And the only reason is because there's a contention around that, around the people who are saying we need to build more highways, go, go, go. And then there's other people saying, no, we need to have other transportation solutions. And so is it possible we could have need both? Well, no, I'm not saying, okay, fair <laughs> enough. But maybe it's not either or. I guess what I'm wondering though is that when I when we looked at Carmel, Indiana's situation, of course they adopted roundabouts like crazy. They had like over 130 or something. Uh, and then uh, they also were adopting walkability, bikeability, all that jazz, all this sort of new infrastructure approach. Um, and then, but then when we look at what's happening here in Texas, it certainly has been, again, a lot of this prescription of big roads, new highways, more, 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 scale, far, you know, distant, long, long stretches. And I'm sitting there going, in, it goes back to our the original transportation guy who came and talked to us, who was talking about doing studies on transportation, and he says, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, we've come up with a lot of, you know, recommendations, and then he, then he says on the side, of course, none of those have actually worked. And so they go, why is it that they can't come up with something that actually works, and why do we keep doubling down on the old paradigm if, it ain't, if, it's, if it's not working? Pre-massive growth in Texas. And I just wonder if you guys have any reflections. I put you on the team or whatever. But but do you guys look outside the box at, at and are there communities that you see that have actually uh, kind of broken the code to some degree? I haven't. It's always latent demand because I started working in Austin, and you always have to make those tough decisions. Nobody wanted State Highway 130 built or State Highway 45 built. But imagine if those hadn't been built, how bad I-35 is now. Imagine how horrible it would be. There's always a latent demand in Texas. People are moving here faster than those traffic projections can, can, can account for. It. You know, we used to grow traffic up at 2% a year compounded annually. The volume <coughs> I've seen around here is just crazy. It's like 8 to 10 to 12% in spots. And it's just, yeah, you can do things to fix it. But yeah, generally, you've got to do stuff with the highways. And you know, you talked about wanting sidewalks and everything. Now, all those shared use paths. It all takes more right away, and nobody wants to give up their right away. It, everybody wants a bike pass and everything, and it's like, okay, it, the right away is getting bigger, and you, and it's not just the width, right? You got to drain that stuff. So now you got these ditches, <laughs> and so it just gets bigger and bigger. Everybody wants everything, but it's just it's impossible to fit all that stuff in, and it's you know you said plow through the countryside stuff, but. So, you know, sometimes that's all you can do because there's such demand out there. You have to build a new road. Yeah, but that's part of the quantitative data that we're not talking about, right? Yeah. So the one thing, we, we talked about this, when we stopped with COVID, that's where we were at. Mm -hmm. We were saying, we need to get the quantitative data. We never did that. And so you're getting that stuff together. But the part of that, <laughs> that you're not including is what that road brings. 
because it fast forwards development, right? That happens. And quantitatively, that impacts the traffic on that road. Then it turns into Katy Freeway because even more homes are built out there, which if that's what Kendall County wants, then we can do that. But the people move to Kendall County, whether you build that road or not, it might push them to that road. Right, but, but that takes but creative no. solutions, which is why this committee was formed in the first place. I, I do think that there, there is literature on how to address late and travel demand. I don't know that I have seen anybody that has, to use your words, cracked the code yet. Yeah. But I think access management is one thing it's a, that yeah. you can do that right. you don't yeah. have because you it greatly increase the efficiency of the roadway uh, with, without by interrupting all of the driveways and intersecting streets. Right. And, and so you, you kind of push development off of it. And, and then hopefully but that I, takes right away, right? Well, <laughs> they have to do it. I mean, it's like, an act, I went to Maine one time, which is a beautiful place. They have great freeways, but they didn't have any access roads. They just had freeways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, where, where is it? Well, they're behind the trees and they're within the developments. Okay, so it, it the model works pretty good there. The woodlands. The same. The that's same. The woodlands. Yeah. And Gary probably knows about that. So I think yeah, but be careful down what you're wishing for because what you're saying is limited access. They're going to end up in comfort. They <laughs> <laughs> can't get off in Bernie's and with it. That's some and we, and we don't want them. <laughs> But you know, you try to live in access, right? So I say raised median along Highway 46 in front of HEB. Well, businesses don't like raised medians and stuff. So there's always a give and take right. for the access management, even. So it's, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, uh, Don, a couple of things that we haven't talked about at all in this committee has to do with, uh, with public transportation. And I'm not sure why that hasn't been part of the discussion. We, we actually, we tried it up here. Yeah. And we, have well, some, we have some conversations about it. I think what it came down to was this linking in with the San Antonio public transportation system. Wasn't there some issue with that or some huge Well, we would have to adopt, agree to impose their sales tax on Kendall County. Right. Well, we tried two different things on that. One, of course, we tried to reverse commute. and. You know, because we thought, well, in San Antonio, there's a lot of people that need jobs. They could transport them up here. Well, it's, you know, and have two or three people on the bus. So that didn't work. We also tried actually having a, a bus service up here. Was that John, when you say we tried that? You know, yep. How far back in time did that go? That was when I was with ACOG. That's why. Well, ACOG still has their ARC bus. Well, they got their yeah. ARC bus. But I'm talking about we actually tried to have a scheduled route. There's not enough people to have a schedule around. So we don't have the demand. Well, it goes back to the question, how long ago was that, and would it be a different scenario today? Well, it's probably 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 we got, we got the, 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 um, I don't want to say NBO. Um, well, what's the word I just told you? That, uh, hey, 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 hey. that got, you know, the, the star scrap on, 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 on demand type stuff. Um, but, you know, we're trying to get the reverse community call, and it just, there wasn't enough people to make it. Well, to your point, though, I think if we're going to really do a transportation report study, I think it needs to at least address public uh, mass transit that, you know, while it's probably a good idea, the public's embrace of that has been well my, my experience is public transportation falls in the same category as low income housing yeah. and, and try to spell those with four letters you know, it's, it's just uh, one thing it's just one thing. The, the thing i saw when actually when we were at that conference earlier but right before covid hit you guys were both at it and the, one of the topics was that doing the tran providing transportation to more rural areas becomes very expensive, especially when you have to move all the way back to San Antonio. And of course, one of the big costs is, yes, it's, it's the, the bus and all that, but it's really the driver and all the health insurance and all the other, and the cleaning and all the other stuff that goes with it. And honestly, my, my when I do it from a, just a cost-benefit analysis, it's gross. I'm back of the napkin at best. Um, but I, I sit there and I go, well, that's where 
yeah, we could maybe do something in town that's more of a trolley, but if we're gonna start to get real about trans public transportation, automation is really gonna be the facilitator because of the cost of it. Because otherwise, it's gonna be seriously subsidized. There's no other way to do it. Like, believe me, I'm a believer. I, I think it'd be awesome. But I'd like to float into San Antonio on an air ride bus. <laughs> I'd be awesome. Um, well, I have a sense that now that now that we can, we were we're talking about Jeff and him. <laughs> we're just up doing city major third or planning, right? <laughs> just Jeff and I just in the back spent thirty minutes just drawing lines, lines on the map. We're not on. <laughs> just you. Uh, <laughs> I think what I'd like to do at the next meeting, uh, two weeks from now, is to hopefully we will have the AMPO crowdsource data to be able to present to everybody and make sure y'all are comfortable with how that's going. I'd like to get, it, I'd like for y'all to really think through this some more, sleep on it, think about it some more, the, the draft outline, and let's try to get honed in on something and I will, I will look at how we might schedule some of these things, some of we can knock off already and just kind of put them on the shelf. But let's, I'm going to try to put a schedule together for how we would address the non-project parts of this uh, in terms of time frame. And then uh, if you have projects, we need to think about how we want to bring this larger, grander projects forward for consideration. Uh, <coughs> do you have anything that we want to put us through? I just, back to Gary's comment about a, a deadline, we do need to set it up. There's not enough external information. I heard what you heard is, I don't think the city of Bernie is going to entertain a bond election on the same year that the school district is for the reason he said, which would have been our next arbitrary deadline. In fact, it probably already would have passed. Uh, is it assumed that, that the district, the district will first in the bond referendum? It looks like they are. They, they, they seem pretty Rich, good. do you know if they, they, have they set a date? Are we looking at? For the for a school referendum, are they looking at the next November May. or May? Next May. So I think you know, Don and I can put forward a, a date when we can talk about it. But it's not like the October thing. We if we don't at least try to set a deadline and work with a sense of urgency, then we'll be here a year from now having the same. Like this October. <laughs> yeah. Between now and this October. We have six meetings. Yeah, let's get some let's get some projects out here. So we've Go got on. we've got your base. I mean, it, it's not too difficult to read through the current recommendations, and then make the very next conversation to be had. You know, regardless of whether we have a, a PowerPoint to help to help with the conversation, but why not bring other ideas forward um, beyond the scope of the, the subcommittee recommendations? I mean, in my mind, we've got. The three buckets that Don identified in the court order. And I think we can start to populate those in draft form while waiting on crowdsource data to validate that these recommendations and cost we will thumb cost estimates to finish making the package around each one, but to even have some sense of committee progress that's tangible, I think would help us all feel like what we could do on the kind of the schedule. Yeah, and I, I was actually thinking, you know, Bitsy, I think you brought up that some of these things can happen in parallel and they'll have to happen sequentially. Um, it might be worth thinking about a, a rough timeline for accomplishing certain sections of the document. Yeah, that, that's what I want to come back to the schedule. Just, okay, I'm sorry, I spaced out for a second. I, I'm repeating that. Um, got a text from somebody. So, um, yeah, so anyway, that was my thought, and I guess I uh, you all agree with that. It was actually one of the right No. It's a project committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think Georgia. Not it. <laughs> she said not it first. <laughs> all in favor? We have a quorum. And can we get so specific as to recommend that the city have a bond issue on a given date? I don't know what the regular election dates are. I used to know May is one, November is one, but I think there's a couple others. No, 
two. There's just two now? Two uniform elections. Two uniform elections, May and November. Okay. I, I don't know. That feels a little presumptuous on my part. Kim. I, I, I don't know. We might recommend that some projects be pursued with bond funding. Okay. Projects be pursued with joint bond and MPO funding. Some projects be, you know. With, that makes sense. Yeah. Timelines. I think we got to leave the policy there. Okay. Uh, Tim, we did also talk about the public transportation. Gary was bringing it up. I don't know it's something you care about as well. Yeah, it is. So uh, it is something that definitely needs to go into this recommendation in some form or fashion. Just yeah. And I, we we might need to talk to somebody who knows how to do all the math on that, just so we really are clear on what that looks like. And I gather from your automated comments that that's what you're talking about. Yeah, automated shows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, part two, Don, we haven't talked about uh, the toll roads. No. Toll roads. Now that may fall in that four letter word about public I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Toll roads. Toll roads. I'm sorry, I still can't hear <laughs> you. Okay. I don't know that we Point have. Point <laughs> I was just thinking, like, I don't know that we have any say in that kind of level. Of, I mean, I guess, like, where, where, what level of planning do, do toll roads have? I mean, I, my understanding, first of all, was that tech stuff took a pretty strong stance against toll roads, and so they weren't really supportive of a lot well, of that. That was before roads. they were really for toll roads. <laughs> that was before <laughs> they were against them. I thought they were against them. No, that's yeah. just the San Antonio yeah. district, too. So there's tech stuff doing toll roads all over Texas. Okay, okay. so it's all right. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're all over the place now. I've got yeah. a toll tag. I, I would tell you <laughs> that one thing we could recommend, Tim, and you're probably familiar with this, is uh, that we might want to consider at some point the creation of a regional mobility authority, mm -hmm. which is a mechanism that yeah. sort of embraces this whole thing. Yeah. They have one in, in Bear County, yeah. and they have several others, Bryan College Station, yeah. the Valley, Dallas, Fort Worth, so yeah. Austin. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be inconceivable that, that something like that would be a good recommendation. I don't know if it's within your, I, by October, I think that's a policy recommendation <laughs> worth considering. I mean, I don't know what the downside is, so I want to talk about that. But yeah. I mean, again, let's try to be bold. Right. It doesn't have to be spaghetti, spaghetti bowls, but bold. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is I mean, I agree that we are kind of in this area that we're getting swallowed up with San Antonio, but at the same time, if the bolder we are, the more we can differentiate this region as something separate, which I'm not saying I'm anti San Antonio, but I am in favor of just the diversity of different characteristics and embracing whatever this is as it evolves and become, is its own place. As long as Rankin and I can bail me, you know, <laughs> we don't really care. I mean, I think there's a number of policies like that, though. Like, there's also congestion pricing, which we've talked mm -hmm. about, which is highly controversial, and just like toll roads are highly controversial, but then there's also, like, limited access roads or, or roads that, Connect connections between neighborhoods that are open during school, dropping kids off time, and then close later, so they're not, they'll become big, commonly used rows. I mean, We've got some of that in our recommendations. Yeah, there's a variety of like interesting little mechanisms we could include in there. And I think those are the types of recommendations that go back to what Ben was saying about being somewhat creative and not just grasping onto the same old, same old. Just because they tried it 20 years ago doesn't mean it won't work today. Right, so I'm looking at the Kendall Cable study. Let's look at it again. I have, in their study, they also had a section highlighting how much public participation they had. If you didn't want to include something like that in our final report, saying That's a really good idea. we had, I don't know what, uh, this many visitors across the many months. Four weeks, months. Many hits to the website, something like this that. Many comments. Many, comments. Yeah. We might need to have uh, open houses and things too. And then, you know, in that regard, you know, as we get closer to rolling out with a draft plan leading to the final plan. Uh, but the other thing too, I'll say with the gateway is that for all their claims of oh, we did so much public engagement, most of the people who were directly impacted by a highway coming through their property had no idea it was coming. And so uh, that's uh, that's that's just the one caveat about outreach. I, I appreciate that they spent a lot of money on it, but. As I understand it, those people who were post the gateway spent a few thousand dollars and were able to notify everybody who was affected. And about 90% of them were like, I had no idea. And that kind of tells you, I don't know. 
tells me a lot. And that probably tells me <laughs> how much effort they put into it. Because we were outreach committee got stopped too. Because yeah. we had some wild ideas of going to schools and all kinds of stuff that we never got to do mm -hmm. because of COVID. So it's something to consider once we get to that point, we do need to have some more engagement with the public. Yeah. Good, good, good point. Good point. We'll talk more. I like Northern, I would like to also um, encourage the idea that somewhere in here we detail out the amount of public input and how we really have such a commitment to that. I don't, I don't know where that would fit exactly, but that seems like something to put on the list of things. To All right, well, we're coming to a time to conclude today's meeting. So uh, wrap this item up and see if there is comments from the public around the world. Yes, ma'am. Um, speaking of dynamite, uh, in, I, and I know I can suggest, but under the environmental, I think there needs to be something detailed in reference to water and how some of the risks involved that we've all learned about, but not everybody has seen Dr. Venny's video whether they choose to, uh, you know, is at their, if they want to. But I do think with the environmental that it, it needs to be taken very seriously and discussed. And then to add, even though I do believe that talking about the costs of um, these potential roads is very important, but I've heard mentioned several times at a few different meetings that a directive from the city and or, or cities has been don't worry about the cost do not worry about the cost at all and so i'm not referring to that as the county thinking that way but perhaps other entities because i've heard it several times Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes um, i thought that northern's suggestion for cost was good and that it uh, would be good for expectation settings so people look at roads and they list, look at your list of projects and they say, wow, that's really good. But if they don't have a, an idea of what it might cost, uh, then that, that might change their mind. And as part of the <coughs> expectation settings, it seems to be you'd want to speak to the timing of delivery of certain projects based on who owns them. If uh, the city owns the project or the county owns the project, the ability to deliver that project is much different than if TxDOT owns that project because then we'd be competing with other TxDOT projects through the MPO and I don't know if you want to speak to that MPO process but again that's one or two sentences about the MPO process and talk about it's a competitive process and we, we would have to rank our project up against others for these scarce dollars. And so, you know, Don, you were talking about the federal bill coming down, and I don't know how Congress will decide to, that that money would be allocated, but the extent that it came down through TxDOT, it seems like that would go to the MPOs as well. Um, so just that as a Good suggestion. Uh, and then uh, the, the one thing that Jonah talked about and Northern was this public participation. Now, I've been coming to these since it started, and I've not been a part of any kind of process that is so welcoming to public participation, so that's very welcome. Uh, now that we're coming to the really the hard part, which is the discussion of the long-range projects, I hope that you'll make sure that when that discussion happens that you'll agendize it in such a way that people will realize okay at this meeting we're going to be potentially talking about connections between 46 and 10 in this quadrant so that people are aware not to stir them up but at least so that you can defend yourself against well we talked about it no one came i think that's very astute comment um, and then as far as they, you have this other section about policy recommendations and y'all have all suggested and they're included in there um, recommendations that don't necessarily directly transportation but affect transportation 
Mr. Kite mentioned that we have an issue here with reverse commutes. And I don't know if it's still true, but it seems like many people who work in service industry here in town don't really live in town. And they don't live in town because we have a housing affordability issue here. Now that's not strictly a transportation issue, but it causes a transportation issue or it might contribute to. So it, it seems like those non-transportation issues that affect transportation should also be mentioned as drivers. Thank you. Thank you. Expensive to work in Bernie because they have to own a car and drive in for a service job. Oh, and um, you know, Fair Oaks, we long ago removed ourselves from VIA. We did that purposely, so. Why? We wanted to use that increment of sales tax for something different. There you go. That's the money. <laughs> well, Seth has raised a really good point about communication. I mean, we just went through this with the city and the UDC. We sent out uh, two or three rounds of postcards, had advertisements in the newspaper, we had a website, we did a bunch of stuff, and nobody really said they got it until we sent individual letters, eight and a half by 11, to everybody's specific individual address, which we did twice. And then finally, oh yeah, yeah, I'm aware of that. So, you know, we can do all we can in the general realm of dissemination of information, but literally until you send somebody a letter that they can open up and, oh my God, it's just addressed to me, they don't pay attention, frankly. And so I don't know how we deal with that. I mean, I, other than sending out individual letters, which is how we resolve that issue, with the city and the UDC. I think we ought to put the news media in charge of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Well, there you go. Part of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> He's our communications subcommittee right there. <laughs> and could you write a report? Well, <laughs> so, so realistically, too, though, it's like it, the, the elephant in the room is still lurking among us, and, and we're not really that. I mean, I know you're drawing, you know, alignments, John, and I know there's some other ideas that have been floated around. I guess the, the thing is, is uh, it's gonna, that's a process all in itself, is to allow space for emotion and for the, and for the process of uh, developing understanding and, or resisting whatever, that, whatever happens. That's part of this process. And I hope, I mean, we just, if we cut it short, then we're gonna end up, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen if we cut it short. Well, I, Someone you know, I'm, I'm willing, and Bob kind of leaned over and said, but what I really mean is we just want to get some pop, some, how did you say it? Some projects populated in those three buckets. Yes. Uh, not necessarily be completely done. And I, and I think that's a fair approach. I, I do think if we force it, uh, you know, I think I think this probably will be doing the community a disservice, but I don't think we can afford to just continue to defer it. I agree, yeah. I agree to across the board. And not a, this was a reminder, because I always dealt with it with other issues, is that unfortunately the last six weeks of the year, it's yeah. difficult to get any work done, so it changes yeah. your, your potential time, on our potential deadlines on trying to get this done, especially if we want to integrate uh, community participation as we roll it out and we present it to the, uh, to the entities that, that, we're, that we're representing. Whether you like it or not, they take the center of the community. Okay, thank you all for your participation, for indulging me with my balcony perspective, and uh, we will see you at the uh, next meeting in two weeks. We'll consider the minutes of this meeting, hopefully, we'll get them out in time. Thank you, Don. Thank you.